Thanks, Ron and Ann. Dr. Craig Evans uh, is not a stranger to those of you who watch the program on a regular basis. Some of you are meeting him for the first time. He's Paisan, uh, Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Acadia University. Uh, he is a prolific author. And his latest book I'm holding here in my hand, Jesus and His World, The Archaeological Evidence. First of all, welcome back, Craig. Thank you very much. I was saying to you in the green room, semi-facetiously, yeah. you, you should sort of be an adjunct staff member here. You're here so often. Oh, but I mean, you're prolific. Um, the book is, is fascinating. Now, you, you, you're, not, you're not an archaeologist. No. But you, archaeology is a part of your overall uh, intellectual disciplines. Uh, you get to Israel, what, once, once a year or so? Yeah. Try to. Try to. Mm -hmm. You visit the sites and so on. Why did you think it was important to, first of all, to write a book about the archaeological evidence for Jesus? Well, a lot of reasons. Uh, for one thing, archaeology is not a field that is static. Uh, there's, there are discoveries made every month. Uh, the discoveries going on in Jerusalem are quite surprising. Caiapha is another place. So there have been a lot of Old Testament related discoveries, but also a New Testament too. And so uh, books like that are needed every now and then be simply because the field continues to grow and develop. But there's another reason too, and, and that's because there is a lot of strange stuff floating around in the popular media, documentaries uh, or books that make irresponsible claims, either saying that Jesus never existed or yes, he did exist, he was married and had kids, you know, and that sort of thing for which there is no evidence. Uh, so archaeology sometimes uh, is misinterpreted and misrepresented. And so people in the public are confused and they don't know what to think. And there's been a lot of this kind of stuff in the last 10 or 15 years. So uh, what my book tries to do is set the record straight, but but at a level that uh, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know Hebrew to understand. Yeah, it. yeah, and I really appreciated that. And you 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 focus in on five things. Uh, one, the uh, potential urban exposure that Jesus had, uh, even though he's growing up in a little village, really called Nazareth. Uh, you talk about uh, the impact of the synagogue on his life, uh, his uh, his literacy. Uh, and how that came about, or lack thereof, <laughs> depending on who the scholar is. Uh, you talk about his confrontation with priests and the temple, and also the Jewish burial traditions that all relate to Jesus. Now, we've got uh, about eight minutes here, so <laughs> obviously we can't deal with it all. The thing that um, I found very interesting was that last chapter on the Jewish burial traditions, because uh, having lived in Israel for seven years, I, I've had exposure to pretty much all those tombs you mentioned, and I've, I've visited most of the sites that you talk about, uh, archaeological sites. But the resurrection, uh, the burial and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the, 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 the burial, the resurrection, the appearances of Jesus are so critical to Christian faith that I, I found the fifth chapter to be really, really fascinating. Talk to me about the uh, Jewish burial traditions and, and why they're important to understanding the uh, reality of Jesus in history. A lot of skepticism with regard to the Easter event, the resurrection of Jesus, ultimately is sourced in a failure to understand these Jewish burial traditions. A lot of people don't realize what the actual laws, customs, and practices were with regard to death and burial, and, and also with regard to those who were executed as criminals, and that's what happened to Jesus. Right. And so the idea, for example, that uh, a criminal would not be buried properly, would be left hanging on the cross for days, weeks even, uh, the idea that maybe at best thrown into a ditch or something where animals might uh, maul the corpse, uh, all of that is misguided. That is not uh, what archaeology shows, and it's not uh, what uh, these burial practices were. And we know this because of contemporary writers like Josephus, the Jewish historian from the first century. He tells us these things. Philo, who's even uh, a little older than Josephus, he tells us the same things. And so what uh, the Gospels in the New Testament tell us is exactly what's in step with the practices of that time and what the archaeological evidence shows. And what it shows is it doesn't matter who you are. You could be uh, Herod the Great. And, and greatly honored, or you could be a criminal who's been executed, every person is properly buried. Maybe not in honor, but always properly buried. And, and the family members know where because they intend to collect the remains, the skeleton, one year later and place them in what we call a bone box or ossuary. Yeah. And I have no doubt that's what the family 
uh, and disciples of Jesus intended. They would collect his remains, their beloved master, put them in a box and put that box in the family tomb one year later. What they didn't expect, of course, was to find that tomb open and the remarkable discovery after that. Which, which, which addresses one of the, uh, the theories to explain the, uh, the resurrection, and that being that the disciples went to the wrong tomb. Uh, th there's no way in terms of Jewish culture that anybody would uh, uh, go to the wrong tomb. No, no, and that really, that is for us moderns to condescend yeah. to the people of antiquity. Yeah. What we're really saying is, we're smart, they're stupid, they yeah. wouldn't even know where Jesus yeah. was buried. I mean, that is really silly. Yeah, and then also the swoon theory. I mean, uh, it, it's, oh. I, I don't know how anybody can give credence to that one. Well, think about it for a moment. Let's imagine that, just for a moment. Yeah. Uh, and you, see, you read this in some of the conspiracy books and yeah. so on. Yeah. Jesus was drugged or he's yeah. badly wounded. He passes out, he's yeah. in a coma, whatever. He really isn't dead. So he's placed in the tomb and then he wakes up a couple days later. Well, okay, let's imagine that. Badly injured Jesus, comatose for a weekend, wakes up early Sunday morning, manages to get himself out of the tomb. Well, first of all, manages to get himself out of the grave well, clothes. I mean, yeah, they were yeah. wrapped, they were wrapped like, like a mummy. I mean, with, with spices between the wrappings. I mean, it would be like a cast, a body cast. Well, Jim, make, uh, put yourself in the role of the disciples. There you are, you're afraid of the authorities. You're waiting for the heat to kind of cool off. You're thinking about getting out of town, hopefully getting back to uh, Galilee uh, in one piece. And then you hear a knock at the door and you open it up and there's the badly injured, wounded Jesus limping into the room. Now what's going to be your reaction? Oh, look at that. Jesus has been raised from the dead, glorified. Mm -hmm. Of course not. You'd see him wounded and you'd think, wow, what a fluke. He manages to survive this crucifixion. Where's Dr. Luke? <laughs> Our beloved uh, rabbi is seriously hurt and in need of medical attention. I mean, uh uh, I remember a few years ago, my wife sprained her ankle playing tennis, and it took her months to recover. Here's a guy who's had spikes driven through his feet, and, and he's walking? Yeah, exactly. I don't think so. No. Now, uh, we just have a few minutes left, and I, I, again, friends, you really have to get the book, and I'll show you how in a minute. I guess it's so, it's so terrific. I'm going to keep it as a resource. Uh, uh, I want you to sign it first, but um, <laughs> one of the perks of my job is I get to keep the book if I want it. Um, the, the argument against the existence of synagogues. Uh, some scholars try to say there were no such thing as synagogues in Jesus' time, and so all of these references to him in the synagogue, being educated in the synagogue and so on, are spurious. Um, archaeology says absolutely not. That's right. Tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that was an interesting theory that someone brought out uh, in the 1990s, saying, you know what, there really weren't any synagogue buildings. Yeah. That's a later thing. That yeah. happened after the temple was destroyed in 70, which means that the four New Testament Gospels and the Book of Acts are all anachronistic. They're talking about things that existed at the end of the first century, but not in Jesus' time. Well, we now know that there are at least seven synagogues prior to the time of the destruction, probably an eighth and maybe even a ninth. And so the evidence just keeps mounting. And, a, and half of these synagogues have been found only in the last 15 years. And accidentally, right there in Galilee at Magdala. Uh, the construction team went in there and began to dig the ground out to put in a new resort, banged up against some stones. Archaeologists came in, unearthed it. Guess what? We have found the synagogue at Magdala. Now I remind viewers, Magdala, Magdalene, yeah. Mary Magdalene. This is her hometown synagogue. And I think it's highly probable Jesus preached in that synagogue on more than one occasion. And this is the kind of thing that we just keep finding in Israel. That's why uh, books like this one, uh, they need, a book like that needs to come out every so many years because we keep finding new things. You know, you mentioned the uh, discovery of the uh, family tomb of Caiaphas, the high priest. Um, I was in Jerusalem with a crew uh, shooting some uh, series that we uh, produced for Huntley Street years ago called uh, Day and Today. And uh, I'm taking a break. We're just south of the city. And I just went for a little walk. And I walked down into the valley in the forest. And here's an area that's got police tape all around it. Yeah. And uh, so I went up to the, the guys who were guarding it. And, you know, my Hebrew's not very good, but I was able to communicate. And I said, guys, what's going on here? Oh, we have to protect it. We were putting in a children's uh, a playground, but uh, we discovered some tombs. I said, oh, really? This is happening all the time in Israel, of course. 
So I did a little investigation, found out it was a, it was a, a Caiaphas family too. Yeah. And, and this is happening all the time. Like I remember my kids were playing in the Hinnom Valley one time and some archaeologists came in and told them not to go into that cave. And uh, it turns out they discovered a little burial amulet there that predated the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, yeah. A little segment from Esther, uh, which uh, the, universe, or the uh, uh, museum, the British Museum, uh, actually over a couple of years were able to take apart without destroying it. Yeah. And here's, here's a little segment from Esther that predates the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, the, the, the history of Israel, and you make the point uh, in your book that about 5% of the available archaeological sites have been explored. That's right, that relate to uh, the Bible. So as you say, yeah. you're going to have to keep writing a book maybe once a year yeah, or every two years. <laughs> well, you know, that book uh, was in the proofs. I was reading the proofs yeah. and then it was announced they found an ossuary with an inscription on it that referred to Caiaphas. Right. And we think it's the granddaughter of Caiaphas, and that was found as, and of course, what could I do? You know, it was too late. Too to make, late. So all I could do was slip in a couple of lines saying, this ossuary's been found. So that's just the way it goes. Yeah. That makes, to me, that makes the field very exciting. The book is called Jesus in His World, The Archaeological Evidence, and Dr. Craig Evans is the author. You can get it by logging on to crosswoods.ca or calling 1-800-265-3100. Uh, very good price, e-store prices. And you can make this a part of your personal library. And friends, I would really encourage you. I, I love reading. I'm reading all the time. I do about three or four books a week for this program. And this one really stands out. And I hope that you get your copy. Thanks for coming our way. Thank you. Craig. And we'll be back with him probably in six months with another book. <laughs> and back with you right after this.